Great. Welcome everybody to our workshop tonight on um, creating events for everybody. For those of you who are new to the chambers, um, you know, bathrooms are around the corner, water and snacks over here. To our folks online, um, the caption is enabled. So please take advantage of that if you, if you would like. Um, for questions, and this is a small group in here tonight, so we're not even gonna do it with, with cards. Those of you online, if you will just put your questions in the chat, we will get to them in the second part of this. Um, it's a long presentation tonight, so please take care of yourselves. It's okay to stand up and move around and take breaks, please. Online, it's fine to have your camera off. Do whatever you need to do to be present and comfortable. And I realize I did not start by introducing myself. I'm Constance. I am um, the Community Opportunities Coordinator. I am a white woman with curly gray hair and glasses and a blue sweater. So we're all going to be doing this tonight to, um, to bring people in if they can't see us. I am pleased to introduce my colleague, Suni Tolton, who will be our moderator tonight. And she will, um, we will have introductions for all of our participants as well. Suni? Good evening, everyone. I'm sure my mic is hanging up well enough. Okay, great. Um, yes, I'm Suni Tolton. I work with Constance in our community services department as the equity and social justice program coordinator and also provide community support. Welcome. Um, we're really excited to have this panel and, and have an opportunity to learn more about how we can provide events that are accessible and welcoming to everyone in our community. And we're all learning how to do this better. Um, and so, yes, modeling um, when we have folks who may have vision issues to describe ourselves and for folks who are online. So I am a, a Samoan Chinese. I have long black hair. I wear glasses and I'm wearing a floral shirt and a green sweater. Um, and so really excited to have our panel here. We have uh, Brandy Padua, who is the day manager for Friendship Adventures. As uh, mm -hmm. Stephanie Ruiz Carvajal, who works with our recreation, specialized recreation programs, and Stacy Flower, who is our um, uh, Department of Social and Human Services um, uh, Access for All lead. And they're all going to talk about their programs. But first, I'm just going to give them a few minutes to share again their role and if they could, if you all don't mind sharing how you came to this work and what kind of, um, what, what, what has brought you in, into the role that you're in now. Absolutely. My name is Brandy Padua. I am the day program director for Friendship Adventures, which is located here in Shoreline. I started, um, I have an adult daughter who has several disabilities. And so this is why I have been part, have become part of Friendship Adventures and the community for adults with disabilities. Uh, and this is why I'm here tonight is to share a little bit more about our story for Friendship Adventures and accessibility and inclusion. Hello, my name is Stephanie Ruiz Carvajal. I am first generation Mexican American. I have middling dark brown hair and I'm wearing a patterned green, gray, blue squared shirt, um, and I have green, green glasses on. Um, my why and how I got into uh, this part of our community, my brother is Eric Olivares. He um, is my annoying older brother who happens to have <laughs> some disabilities. Um, he was born premature, and so with that, he has real palsies, intellectual and developmental disabilities, and I was raised to look at life from his perspective on how I can help him uh, fight for him and help and create a safe place for him to live. Um, and so I've done that, I say 20 years, I'm 31, so... I, uh, professionally, I've worked with the city of Shoreline since I was 19. Uh, so it'll be 12 years in June, specifically working with uh, our specialized recreation. So um, my why is my brother, but also uh, my participants in our programs. 
Hi everyone, I'm Stacy Flower and um, I am an older person <laughs> with uh, salt and pepper hair just below my shoulders and blue glasses. And um, I am uh, light skinned and I'm wearing a, a multicolored polka dot um, outfit. <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to to be here today. I'm um, I've been working with uh, well, I've been in in my field for, I don't know, 30 some years. But um, I've been with DSHS with the Developmental Disabilities Administration for this is my 23rd year. Um, and uh, in the last um, four or five years, um, I've been working with um, uh, uplifting um, and normalizing conversations around access needs actually for employees. Um, we were, you know, were, we tried to be very person centered for the folks we support and, um, and serve. Um, but, um, uh, I have started this program to be person centered for DSHS employees for employees access needs, um, in the workplace. And, um, uplifting the conversations so that folks, um, a lot of people have not disclosed um, for various reasons. The team that they're on and their supervisor might be perfectly um, a safe space, but maybe from previous past experience. Um, but uh, anyway, so I work with, um, with accessibility for employees and I also work with uh, accessibility for um, uh, different organizations as a volunteer or as a, a contract worker, um, no, usually nonprofit organizations. So um, anyway, that's Great. that's what brings me here. Yeah. Although I'm, I'm here as a resident of Shoreline, I'm not here representing the state, but, yeah. <laughs> but that's my background. <laughs> Okay, applause already. Thank you. Yes. yes. Um, so we're excited to have all um, of our panel members and we've asked each of them if they wouldn't mind sharing about an event that they've planned and um, some of the considerations that you took in planning it, some of your thoughts um, around that. But also, Brandy, you're going to start us off and give us some background and overview around um, information around folks with Absolutely. Again, my name is Brandy Padua. I am with Friendship Adventures. I apologize. I did miss the description part of my being, and so I will start with that. I am American Korean and Asian Korean, and I am a resident of Snohomish County. I do happen to take quite a bit of time here in Shoreline, though, uh, with Friendship Adventures on Mid Bill and 185th. I am wearing a white lace shirt, a black jacket. I have black hair with a lot of gray <laughs> and I do wear eyeglasses for long distance as well as nearsightedness. So part of uh, the reason why I'm here is to share friendship adventures, accessibility and inclusion. Uh, it started out, sorry, excuse me, with my daughter, as I said earlier, who's 23 years old. So she has several disabilities. We started seeing those at age four. Uh, she has seizure disorders as well as uh, wanted autism, hypertension, inverted ankles, uh, intellectual developmental delay, as well as other global delayments as well. So she graduated in 2021 from public school systems. And then we moved on to um, then I knew at that point that I needed to make some decisions for our life as a single mother. Uh, she, we, I had three options was either to put her into a group home or find another job to compensate for the extra care that I would have to hire for a caregiver for her or find a different avenue of career. And that's what I did, the latter part. So hence me being at Friendship Adventures. Um, excuse me. So you could see some brief statistics behind us. 
Um, part of it, I, I thought they were very interesting because the social, the SSI, SSDI income at 1600 is pretty notable. I don't know about you, but I can't live off 1600 um, a month. So I thought that was very uh, noted. Um, Friendship Adventures takes a lot of uh, pride in the fact that we keep affordability. We keep programs affordable for our people. Um, we also, there. you can also see that Shoreline has a community, a population of adults with disabilities that are under 65 years of age at an 8.4 average. Washington State is a 9.1. So there are quite a few different, um, there is quite a demographic here in Shoreline. This is why Friendship Adventures is here. It's also because there's a Fircrest, uh, the Fircrest Residential Center, which houses over 200 uh, residents. So this is uh, this is our hub. This is where we're at. And these are the people that we that we service. So a Friendship Adventure started um, over 20 years ago with Maureen Browning, who had a brother of Down syndrome, Dean. And so at that point, she, recreation and socialization was not available back then and they started just in their living room with a television inviting friends over and it became larger and larger and larger until it ended up becoming a foundation a nonprofit organization um, 20 years ago and we've served over 1500 participants so this is um this is pretty exciting that we're seeing all these changes coming about with inclusion and accessibility and this is wonderful that shoreline is offering this um, resource uh, the day program has daily activities as well as hourly and with weekly activities we have destination events that we do so you'll hear me discussing how we're accessible through those programs <clears throat> excuse me and again, that that is what Friendship Adventures is. We are a program that is based off of accessibility. So we either bring access, we bring people in, we bring contractors in, we bring um, entertainers in, or we go out into the community and find a safe zone for us. And of course, um, safety is our number one concern with our people. So that is how we keep accessibility first and foremost is off safety to make sure that we have access to bathrooms, that we have access to safe, safe pathways, safe uh, pavements, safe, uh, uh, what do I want to call ramps. Um, we also have accessibility through our day program with having access through access bus system. And uh, we have a loaner, so we're able to go anywhere throughout our areas here. Um, we've used that bus to travel to Seattle Space, Space Needle for our day program events. We've used it for overnight camp trips to go to Camp Watskowitz, which is over in North Bend. Um, there's also um, ferry rides. We've gone on ferry rides. We've gone just across the island just for some ice cream. So that that bus has been amazing for us, and we're so thankful for it. So we we start out with our events as brainstorming, and it starts with a team effort. Maureen Browning, the founder, actually starts most of this, and it's based off of the demands and the wants from our population, our adults with disabilities. We found that uh, our intellectual disabilities. We found that music is the the foremost. So some of our programming that's been most popular has been like a glee or musical um, drama, theatrical or uh, karaoke. We have a karaoke night. So uh, we do all of this and we bring it either to Friendship Adventures, the academy on that's actually the old police department, um, or we go out into the community. That's that's the main portion of our accessibility. Um, and then, of course, our staff, our personnel, very important to have our personnel in place. Um, we always need to make sure that we're safe. So we have to have coverage. And so for instance, if we are having a dance that has a hundred participants, we wanna make sure that we have 20 aids on hand. And that's also creating um, accessibility because we are using physical motion. We're using physical um, abilities for those that may need uh, redirection for those that may have unbalanced issues. It's also a really big thing for advocacy. So um, let's see. 
So we've gone to Mariner games. And of course we start this out um, by brainstorming as a team, finding out what we want to do, what, what we're going to see our population actually be entertained by. And if they're going to take anything away from it, meaning life enrichment, that's what we're aiming for. Happiness, well-being, physical well-being, um, communication, all of those pieces that we can access, we will. Um, speaking of technology, we've used technology to access. So for instance, we have iPads with ProLoquo, uh, participants that come through, and so they can use their voice to access these things or and tell us if they need to go to the bathroom or, or you know, use that communication factor to access areas. We're also very adaptive. So there's been many times where we've actually go out, gone out on field trip and we have been, we've had to adapt our day based off of the accessibility. So there's an example of where we've gone to a, um, Actually, we went down to Westlake Mall to do shopping. We took the light well, the light rail, fully expecting that we'd have accessibility. Although the, when we got down to our platform, the elevators were out, several elevators. So we had to do quite a bit of walking and rolling and which unfortunately cut our activity down. Um, so our engagement was shorter but we adapted, we overcame, and that's what we do at Friendship Adventures. We make sure that we are adaptable. We make sure that we have put, that, that we can have every measure for our, our for our people to be able to access levels such as just even dietary needs. We have uh, communication is a big factor, so we keep a lot of registration paperwork while we're doing events, and it will include special dietary needs, if we're having food menus, um, it will include uh, uh, emergency contacts in the event that we're having an event that we can reach out. So we use that, that's also available online. Um, and speaking speaking of online, where actually all of our registration is all done, uh, either paper or printing, and writing and returning. And the reason being is because I do believe that we have a gap in our communication system to be able to access gener a different generation accessing the internet and being able to, um, to be able to adapt, and, not adapt, but to be able to communicate, engage with out the resource of the internet is what we're having difficulty with right now. So we do a lot of things paper format still. We're moving, we're changing, we're adapting. Um, <clears throat> but with that being, we use a lot of platforms. We do have other platforms such as Facebook. We have our website. Um, we do a lot of internal networking. We have several generations, well, not several generations, but we have about 1,500 participants that have been with us for you know, some of them three decades. So it's pretty um, encouraging that we can, that we can reach out still. And we look forward to seeing some improvement in accessibility for uh, electronic devices. At one point, we'd love to be able to, at Friendship Adventures, have some sort of uh, technology class to be able to assist and have, um, you know, that to have, maybe you might know, a, uh, a software system that's adaptable for our people that can somewhat function with a touch device and be able to make those decisions and keep safe. So, yeah, one more minute. Sure. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Well, in, in any case, um, in conclusion, we do have uh, our new adventure at Friendship Adventures. And again, it's about accessibility. We are traveling to Texas uh, for a fully inclusive themed park. Uh, there are some of our participants that will be able to actually have a fair, ride a Ferris wheel zip line and be able to experience that. This is the only one that we know of in the world that's inclusive uh, to to people of disabilities. So on that note, I will finish off. And I just have a couple little leads for you guys. I know that Outdoors for All is gonna be having a free adaptive bike ride starting May 1st. 
um, seven days a week. Also, the Shoreline YMCA is also having an adaptive pickleball. Uh, you don't, there's no register, or you do have to be registered with a YMCA, but you can drop in, and that's on Thursday and 3.30. So thank you for listening to my story of friendship adventures and my daughter, and I will give that back to you. Thank you, Brandy. And I'm sorry, I should also, just for everyone, we'll, we're having each one present, and then we'll have a short break about 8 o'clock, and then we'll can just open Q&A. Uh, open questions and answers. So we haven't heard the last, you, you know, you, you, and, and that's so great that you talked about that um, inclusive adventure park. I just heard about that on the news. So, um, so Stephanie, thank you. Hello. Um, I am Stephanie Ruiz Carvajal. Um, pictured up there is my older brother. Um, some photos from when we were younger, built in best friend slash enemy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also a very wonderful teacher. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about a specific event that we've planned through and some pros and cons of planning an event um, and what to look for. So when we are planning events, we always put our lenses of how are our participants gonna be able to enjoy this to the fullest capacity. Uh, there is a quote by uh, an actor, Emma Thompson, that says, being disabled should not uh, mean being disqualified from having access to every aspect of life. So honestly, that I'll just leave it at that. But um, when we decide that, you know, us as people, we have a lot of autonomy on what, where we get to go, when we get to go, whether we have Uber or take the bus, walk, we don't have to check in with anyone else. They usually have guardians, staff. They're not, they don't have a lot of autonomy to just go out into the community. Access, you have to plan one day ahead. Access is community transit. So um, you have to call at least 24 hours to be able to get a window, right? And so you have to give a broad window. Um, so we put on our lenses. How is someone who uh, needs assistance? Either they use a wheelchair, they use a walker, hand over hand. Um, my brother has zero palsy, so uh, his walking is great, but uneven uh, sidewalks usually end up in a trip or fall. Um, but otherwise, bull in a china shop, he it will knock everything over, including you. Um, and, or someone with low or no visibility. So, so how is someone going to maneuver a crowd? Uh, how is someone going to communicate with um, a tablet or sign language um, if you're in a crowded place and it's loud or overstimulating, someone who has auditory sensory needs or just you get overstimulated. I have neurodivergent, I have ADHD, so sometimes things just get a little bit overwhelming. So figuring out some of those needs, we start with uh, reasonable accommodations. Um, we'd like to give ourselves up to three weeks um, for a reasonable accommodation uh, notice. So that helps us understand if there's a special ask above what we already are giving. Um, we do liability and paperwork. So we get as much information um, as we can. Um, what frustrates them? How do you motivate them to get started? How do you, um, do they like kids? Do they like dogs? Dislikes, likes, how do we motivate? How do you transition? Like, what can we say? to help make this a better uh, event or experience for them. So we go to the Everett, Aqu the Everett I always get them combined, the Everett Aquasox baseball. Um, pros, they are the most accommodating, kind, understanding. You, Chad, he, I email him and he's always willing to hop on the phone and communicate and um, problem solve together. Um, 
So we usually do picnic at the park and we have dietary restrictions, gluten-free, dairy-free. And so um, he allows us to bring in some things if we need to help supplement or they provide that. Um, some cons is the parking lot is very makeshift. So it's makeshift ADA parking spots. So we drive a 15 passenger accessible van. It is parked at the top level if you want to go take a look at it. But it is um, difficult when someone parks right next to you and you have doors that open on the side and people don't really read or think about the accessibility or if you need to take the ramp out if you're blocking that ramp. So moving the van in or out of spaces when other cars are parking or leaving. Um, their entrance is a steep walkway, driveway type. Um, and so, as you can see in one of the photos, um, we have a participant that uses a walker and he, he gets rolling. So we have to do a hand over hand or walk in front of him and um, guide him down the path. Um, cashless pay. This has been probably one of my biggest problems um, in uh, post-COVID. Um, it's not accessible for all. Our participants do not have, they're not in charge of their debit cards and are in charge of their money. So not being able to take cash is very hard. They wanna buy souvenirs, but when you go cashless, there's just not that opportunity to buy the souvenirs because a lot of them, like, yeah, they just don't have access to that. They're carrying cash and they have they want receipts and things back. So mm -hmm. that honestly has been a barrier and that we've seen post COVID because a lot of places, a lot of sports stadiums have transitioned to cashless. So, um, and then I've circled, these are the two um, ADA spots. They have ramps that um, lead to these seats, but they are also general admission. So first come first serve, you can have a ticket there. They are available, but People love to sneak into some seats um, that are wide open right in front. Um, so it is very frustrating because um, we either split the group between these two sections and the restrooms only are on one side. As you can see, they're right here. So we're eating on this side, then having to run through an enormous crowd with 10 people five people who have, need to go use the restroom. So those are some difficulties within um, planning a trip. Um, but we do our best. Uh, we pivot. We are flexible. You can prepare, prepare, prepare. But honestly, it's a good attitude and open mind. Flexibility is probably one of our greatest tools. Mm -hmm. And created, like, creative uh, problem solving. Um, I think some great um, support and training in some of these events is we always do a general walkthrough. Just because it says it's ADA does not mean it is ADA by any means. There is a whole spectrum of standards for ADA. Someone can say there's this ADA parking spot and then they put their dumpster trash where your ramp is supposed to go. So yes, there is an ADA parking spot, but where do you unload? How do you get that person out of your van safely without backing up and unloading them in the parking lot? Um, all ADA parking spots are different sizes. We have actually gone and measured <laughs> the parking spots um, just because we have a big access van. So um, it is difficult. We try to prepare as best as possible. We do want to keep our participants safe. We want to make sure that if we do a walkthrough that we're thinking of where are the holes? Are there bright spray paints to change the levels that show that there's a level change? Um, that helps people visibility. They understand that, hey, 
I'm walking and there's going to be a divot in the sidewalk. Um, so it's flashing. It's I've also um, put my text with black and uh, yellow background. This helps people with low visibility um, who need more to read. Like So with a white backdrop, it does not show the letters um, as well. So we've had participants with letter boards who have set their colors as yellow and black for the contrast. Um, what else? We do a lot of paper flyers. Um, we are lucky we have some admin and they do registration over the phone, uh, in person and online. So uh, we do our recreation guide and we do registration weeks and then it's open for everyone to um, get in. Uh, but we do have to have a liability waiver and um, their information so that process can go along quicker. Um, we do not uh, toilet and feed. Um, we are just not trained and we do have a one to 10 staff ratio. So we're just not capable with that with four staff, but um, we don't turn people away. We want to keep as many people to give everyone an opportunity and access to something that they would not have if programs like ours did not exist. So um, they can bring a caregiver and aid uh, and someone to assist in that who is trained to, uh, to help that specific person. Um, so when event days happen, we always give ourselves time. We give our, ourselves time, grace, and we rely heavily on our team. Um, when things happen, which they always do, you know, best laid plan, sometimes doesn't you go through A through Z. And of course, the one thing that you don't plan for is the one thing that puts a wrench in your plans. Um, yeah, we just try to prepare for everything, like as much as possible. And then, yeah, like, again, give yourself some grace, give yourself some time, debrief after, but don't focus on the bad only. There's a time to communicate, talk, and uh, acknowledge the good parts. Please, please, please always acknowledge the good parts because we can get lost in all the bad and the coulda, woulda, shouldas. But um, if you try to put good attitude and a great spin on it, I think the participants get a lot more joy because they're empaths. They feel what you feel. And if you have a good attitude towards um, some of the cons of the day, um, they really will focus on whatever you present to them. So um, I think that's it for me, right? <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie and Stacy. Okay. Well, I I was just absorbed in, in what they were saying and, and, um, and so now I have to switch gears. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm Stacy, and um, I am going to, and this is my access need. I can't really see what I'm doing here. Um, well, I I brought. Uh, well, I'm going to be focusing on um, on creating accessible online spaces, virtual spaces. Um, that's what I was asked to focus on today. So um, I'm going to talk about that. And these are very small. Um, I do have handouts over there. Um, but um, so uh, this is what I've been doing every day because I've been, I work full time from home and, um, and I help with, uh, with online accessibility quite a bit. So um, uh, this role, this uh, these three pages here are about um, some notes on how to be an accessibility point person for virtual spaces. Um, 
I've got one, two, three up here, but I think they're too small to see from, unless people online can see them. Zoom? Oh, oh. I think if you hover over. Okay. You, you can do it. <laughs> well, if, you want to, if you want to go back to the first page, you can hover. Oh, there you go. If you have to click on it, there you go. Oh, yay. There you go. See? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's much better. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I wasn't going to just read through these, but I brought them for you um, for some pointers. Uh, so if you are setting up a virtual um, meeting, a virtual gathering of, of some kind, you, you might not need an accessibility point person. But if you're going to have, um, if it's a larger group that's going to be online, um, it can be a good idea. And uh, an accessibility point person or access, access coordinator, whatever you choose to call it, um, when you uh, are uh, organizing a, a meeting or an event that's going to be online and you send out um, you know some outreach or invitations about that whatever you're you're sending out in advance to um, to people who you hope will attend um, whoever your whoever is going to be your point person it's um, I recommend having that having that person's name in that outreach and have welcoming language um saying you know this this is your this is your access support person contact this person in advance for anything that um needs to be planned ahead of time uh and then that person will take the responsibility for um uh you know who whoever reaches out. If someone needs um, materials in a different format, different contrast, um, if if people who will be attending who use a screen reader, actually a lot of these things you would want to plan for anyway, even if someone doesn't request it because um, they're easy things to plan for. And whenever we can, we want to you know, access is a communal responsibility. Um, we all have access needs at one time or another, and there are um, so many hidden disabilities, people who are neurodivergent, which can include ADHD, as, as you said, or dyslexia falls under neurodivergence. Um, uh, so many, I mean, I've read that one in four people has some kind of hidden disability, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's more than that. Um, and so uh, so these are, are things you can plan for. If someone has low vision and uses a screen reader, you can make sure that your materials um, in advance have embedded image descriptions that um, when someone puts uses a screen reader, they see the image description, but other people don't see it. Um, or you can have both. I like to have both um, embedded image descriptions for folks using a screen reader and also have an image description available for other folks. So, um, so these are things you can plan that the accessibility point person would take care of in advance of an event. Um, whether someone reaches out or not, it, it's easy to do and it's welcoming and it's, um, and it's a way of, um, of creating a culture of belonging for everyone. I mean, inclusion is, as I think I've said to you, inclusion is great, but for some people, inclusion is like, we're, we're welcoming you in, but you have to fit in these, in these arbitrary you know, parameters, but for belonging, it's, we welcome you in as you are. <laughs> and, um, and so part of it is just opening up that conversation and inviting people to reach out in that the 
original outreach, as I mentioned at first, saying, you know, please reach out to this person and maybe give some examples because some people might not even realize what they can ask for. Um, and of course, if, you know, if someone, if you're having an interpreter, an ASL interpreter or a live interpreter, sorry, allergies. Um, <laughs> uh, though, of course, those are things that the accessibility point person would, um, we need a new name for that, don't we? That's a mouthful. Should APP? I just say access contact, <laughs> access coordinator? APP? <laughs> <laughs> we always need more abbreviations in this world. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, access contact, I'll say just for brevity right now, um, that person would co would coordinate with any um, interpreters that you're going to have online for your event. So um, uh, if it's a larger event, it's great to just have an ASL interpreter anyway, whether someone requests it or not. But, um, uh, and I thought of this when Suni said, think of something that went wrong to share. <laughs> and, and, um, you will appreciate this example. Uh, well, I don't know if appreciates the right word. You will understand. understand. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, some people might might need a live interpreter, which is different from an ASL interpreter. Um, and and oftentimes, a uh, um, someone who has challenging speech that people who um, who don't know them would have a hard time understanding their speech. Um, I was the access point person for for an event where um, uh, one of the one of the panelists was uh, someone who had challenging speech, and um, and it was going to be online. And this person requested um, a live interpreter, and I didn't think to schedule enough time for the interpreter and the person to meet ahead of time so the interpreter could get to know this person's speech patterns. So we had like 200 people online and people in person and start the event and the interpreter could not understand this person. And it, and it was just, it was terrible. And I still, I'm not over it. <laughs> and it was a while ago. <laughs> we fail um, and then we learn. Yeah. From our we fail better the next time. <laughs> um, so, you know, those are things, those, that's one of the reasons why, and you, you want an access point person, but it's also, you know, you're, you're going to make mistakes and, um, and you want to have conversations with the people who reach out about, um, you know, some people aren't used to talking about this stuff, about what they need. So having that time to talk to, to people to see how you can, um, how you can best support whatever their access needs will be. Um, somebody, some people might um, prefer a low STEM environment, which is possible to do online. Um, and so if that's the case, um, uh, you know, if, oh, I know a lot of people who, who, um, who can get kind of overwhelmed in, uh, in a virtual space with, um, uh, you know, with presentations, with, with too much sort of too much going on. And, and, um, anyway, if, uh, it, you can you can make things more accessible for, for everyone. Um, you know, people who might not need that particular support are, you know, they, they aren't losing anything <laughs> by having those um, practices in place. So um, and then everyone gains because everyone can can be their full self and participate um uh you know in whatever way they need to i like to you know invite people to leave their camera off if um you know people with with anxiety or with 
who knows we're not we don't need anyone's life story if someone says this is what they need that's what they need <laughs> so um so we welcome people to have their cameras off if they are um if that's how they can best uh, participate fully you know as as what what constant said in the beginning whatever you know, we want to try to create a space where people know that whatever they need to be present in the space is welcome. So um, that kind of language is important. And uh, the access person um, would, would give a brief intro at the beginning saying that, um, you know, saying those things. And also that person is available during the event itself to uh, to support anything that might come up if um, if someone needs uh, if someone needs caption corrections like if if someone has poor audio and so the captions um, aren't picking up what's going on in the in the space then then that person can do caption corrections either directly with whoever needs it or maybe in the chat, you know, to work that out depending on hmm. the space. <laughs> um, and uh, that that person can be available if even if um, uh, as I as I said, folks who are neurodivergent will sometimes reach out to me and say that this is this is getting overwhelming. Um, and so, you know, in a private message and I'll just, I'll just, uh, chime in and say, Hey, can we, I don't have to say someone reached out to me. I'll just say, Hey, we need, can we just take a, a quick 30 second stretch break or one minute stretch break to whoever's, you know, the other people in the meeting and just, um, uh, you know, it could, who knows when someone does reach out, chances are there are other people who have the same need and haven't reached out. So <laughs> it benefits everyone. And then it kind of helps people reset who are getting a little overwhelmed. Um, so let's see what else. <laughs> for, uh, for having a, um, a more accessible virtual space. Um, you know, you, you never know what will come up. Um, and it's it's nice to have a person there. Uh, even if someone doesn't need support through the entire meeting or event, um, you know, I don't know, book club meeting, whatever it is. Um, even if someone doesn't need support and the the access support person is just there, um, that's okay too. I mean, just having the person there sends a welcoming, inclusive culture of belonging um, message. And maybe next time someone will reach out in advance or or during or um so let's see what else. And there's, I don't know, I don't remember if there's anything here about how to create a low STEM environment. I probably have that somewhere else, but but uh, in some cases people will, will schedule two different meetings, like um, have a separate meeting where they say this one is, is specifically low STEM. And, um, you know how some meetings people will have music during um <laughs> break time yeah, yeah or you know no, none of that <laughs> you know ask people maybe not wear something like this <laughs> we're very you know. busy up here <laughs> <laughs> if you're trying to create a low stim virtual space maybe think about what you're wearing um, I'll sometimes ask people, try to be careful about, and, and I have to remind myself, but try to be careful about a lot of hand movements in front of your face or, um, 
if you if you are someone that needs to be standing and moving around and that's how you can best focus, maybe turn your camera off um, so that that's not uh, distracting to other people in the virtual space if, if you're trying to create a low stem virtual space. Um, it's all pretty, you know, it, pretty easy to do if you if you know to do it and and you're intentional. Um, and it can make a huge difference for folks that that otherwise just wouldn't really be able to be present very well. Um, and it doesn't really take anything away from anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of simple things online. It's nice to um, to say your name before you speak. This is Stacy. Blah blah blah. Um, that can be really helpful for people who otherwise would have no idea who's speaking. Um, the visual descriptions that we did at the beginning that that's really helpful for a lot of people online who um, otherwise wouldn't know. Um, some people who do appreciate the visual descriptions um, have told me that that they like it when someone includes a, just a tiny little tidbit of something personal, so that it so that it's just more genuine. <laughs> um, and so you know, sometimes you try to do that. Um, so I, I I don't have any notes. I'm just talking off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> and I could just keep going and going. Oh, that's but... been wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> your your off the top of the of your head has been covering a lot of great information. So um and, and I wanna... I can't see this at all by the way, so <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> um and it's think... all a blur. It's all a blur, but yeah. um, I think folks have picked, well, I handed out, oh, the, okay. um, so they have it, and we have extra copies if folks want to give it out, and I know Constance is going to be able, because um, thank you, Stacey, that you um, were uh, um, generous to provide that, and we'll have that online for the folks who are on Zoom. Um, they can uh, get access to the handout also. Um, and so before we take a little break, I just wanted to give um, our panelists a moment. If Was there something that you, you did want to, sh that I, when I stopped you, moved you, moved on, if there was one more thing you wanted to share or something you wanted to add before we take a short break? Give you that minute. I do, actually. I would love to add um, part of our accessibility at Friendship Adventures is to be able to have funding, and that helps us be able to move forward in a lot of different areas. Because again, you know, we have that monthly that monthly um, SSDI of, you know, a little bit over 1600 So we do try to keep everything affordable. So the grants that are out there that we can access to provide more accessibility is, uh, you know, they've they have started inclusion. They've included inclusion as well as transportation and grants. So we do try to participate in those so that we can be awarded and hopefully be able to have more opportunity. I think when we are just trying to be flexible, I think with the tools that we're given uh, with personal experience, hands-on training. Um, it's always great to ask questions. Um, when you ask questions, it opens up the space uh, to learn more. Um, if you keep those thoughts in your head and you, none of us claim to know everything. We don't know what we don't know. And opening up that conversation to ask a question in a safe space, I think helps you grow, helps you better prepare. If we fail, you fail better the next time. Um, there's those moments, those one mo that one moment that sticks with you, you're like, oh, wow, <laughs> maybe next time. Um, yeah, I'll give myself more time uh, as a point person or there, uh, you know, figure out kits. Um, we have so many backpacks in our van um, for trips 
We have one that's specifically um, extra clothes, uh, depends, wipes, uh, gloves, bodily fluid kits, um, first aid kit, and then we have um, cups and plates and other ones. And then we also have um, fold out chairs that we carry around with us in case we go to a park and all the picnic tables are taken up and we don't have someone that has the mobility to get off the ground um, safer for them to get out of a chair. Um, prepare, prepare, starting from negative, right? It doesn't hurt anyone to come over prepared. Um, if anything, trying to scramble and uh, when these needs arise and you're not prepared, we carry headphones with us, we carry fidget toys, um, a cheap um, earplugs for when we do go to places and we do get overstimulated, the hand over hand. Um, there's very basic needs that, or basic things that we could do to cover uh, a wide variety of needs. So yeah, coming prepared with headphones, um, fidget toys, um, if we're overstimulated, a place where we can take a break get back to neutral um and i tell my participants this all the time we live in a world where anything can go wrong people are mean out there we don't not we don't understand everyone but we come into the safe place where there's people trying to understand trying to get to know us make sure we're safe but also to have fun and to get access to the things that they would not otherwise have. Um, so as we get given things and opportunities, um, we like to give back to the community too. So we're, we always want a purpose. Our whys are very important. So getting to know your participant and the community that you're serving, um, first and foremost, um, I think it was just getting to know why we do what we do and who we work with and who we work for um, is just the first step. All right. Oh. <laughs> do, do you have? Um, sure. Well, we're we're just after eight, so but um, I just wanted to to emphasize. Uh, um, Keep in mind hidden disabilities and and um, I mean neurodivergence is huge. There are so many things under that huge umbrella, <laughs> um, but so many other other things. Someone with with chronic pain, someone with um, a compromised immune system, or um, you know who who knows what that uh, that people are. Um, are dealing with in your in virtual spaces, so um, you know I try to offer uh, a virtual option or a hybrid option when you can, because um, for some people that uh, you know it's just it would be too much of a struggle to to attend in person for a whole variety of reasons. But um, but if you can if you can offer someone to to join virtually, it really uh, can can make a big difference for a lot of folks. Um, I mean, if if I came here um, sitting there, I wouldn't be able to see anything here. <laughs> and um, and I'm not sure if I would hear everyone very well either. And uh, so, I mean, that's just me, but um, there are just, the the list is probably endless of, of hidden disabilities that, that people might have that you don't know about that um, where they can participate much better virtually. So if you can offer that to folks, um, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we're just gonna take a 10 minute break um, and folks can stretch, grab some water and, and uh, do what you need to do. And then we'll come back and open it up for questions in the chat, 
uh, none? Okay. Um, and then for all of you. So have your break. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Hope you got some stretches and I heard lots of great conversation going on um, in the room here. Um, so as we said, we just want to open the time for folks on the chat um, and in the audience to ask our panelists. And Constance, you're going to start us off. I am. I actually have a question for all of you. I think so much of what you've talked about really um, is applicable to people in the community planning events. And if it's an actual event, um, you know, of, of, God, not that online ones aren't actual, but an in-person <laughs> one, um, if, if each of you could maybe just talk about one thing that feels like people should be paying attention to. And Stacey, do you, would you recommend that there be an accessibility contact person as people are developing an event, how would you plan that in? So just kind of a general question for the three of you. And we've got a good one online and I saw I saw Dom's hand up. So go ahead. Me? Anybody. Oh. <laughs> um uh yeah, it's a it's a good idea to have a um a, 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 some, I mean, depending on the event. Um, I mean, you might already know who's coming and and have a relationship with them to to just uh, to just ask them um, if they have any access needs for an in person event. But um, but yeah, for a larger event, even a, a neighborhood event, um, you would want to have someone go to. Uh, the you know prospective venues wherever you're going to have the event and find out what um, what kind of access it really has uh, you know as as we've heard if places might say they're ADA compliant but it doesn't mean anything they a lot of times they don't know um, you know they don't understand what that means so you'd want to go in person and really um check the place out and then in your um invitation and and outreach have access information about the space um like ventilation um access to the building itself if you know if um if there's you might want to mention if there's public transportation and how far it is and and what the the grade is is it level from public transportation to the venue um, where someone would be able to even navigate that? I mean, if there's a public transportation, you know, within half a block, but but the um, the terrain is not accessible, then then that that's not um, that's not going to work. <laughs> and um and the the place itself just take a look if it's indoor or outdoor just um check everything out and let people know and then um if it isn't accessible to someplace else uh, cuz cuz that's important even you know some things some people are very sensitive to fragrances so um you know, those are are things you can ask ahead of time. Do you do you need a um, if you have a list of things that you know, reach out and tell us if you need this, this, and this. That um, that's often one people ask for. I need a a space that that is designated fragrance free. So that can be one thing. Um, if there's a place where um, 
where, you know, someone can use as like a quiet space if somebody just needs to, to, um, you know, remove themselves for a bit and wind down, <laughs> then um, you might want to look for that as well when you're looking at a venue. Um, but yeah, it's good to have, have an access person who knows what they're looking for, do all of that and put that information in your outreach. So, so folks know what to expect. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Brandy, Stephanie, oh, any absolutely. Um, suggestions? I always have something to say. <laughs> um, a suggestion, one of the things though, like Stephanie, being prepared, um, trying to plan ahead for all of the potential downfalls, um, also preparing. So for instance, you know, if we have an outside event in a community and we have people that have light sensitivity, will that event offer some potential aids sunglasses, hats, um, the more that you can, not necessarily accommodate, but the more that you can prepare for the event for specifics and you have that available as a resource that will help bring populations into your event. Mm -hmm. I suggest just doing a walkthrough. Um, I know I mentioned lenses. Um, I took a training and I can't pinpoint when it was, but, um, we, we need reading glasses, you know, to help us, uh, read better. So essentially putting our lenses on of the perspective of that person, you know, uh, how would someone with a walker get through? Is this, is this grade, is this terrain feasible for this participant for someone who, um, even just inches between the sidewalk divots, those can take someone out. So um, understanding who is registered or who signed up for your program, but in terms of like a community event, which is bigger, um, having, yeah, having that per point person, mm -hmm. um, I think is generally um, a great place to start. Um, my team, our specialized recreation. Um, we are all. We try to be at all city events. Um, we do the photo booth, but um, we're there and available when anything uh happens and to assist um with our community and um. Yeah, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> It, it, I actually, um, there's a great question online and then Dom will get to you that I'm, I'm going to actually add a little bit to here too. Um, Alex is asking, what are general accessibility needs to be prepared for in the case I have no prior knowledge of accessibility needs? What are some ways to ask guests what their needs are or avenues to allow them to share their needs? And I think you've expressed that a little bit, but you know, you've, it's day of, you've got something going on, you may not have prepared for something. Um, you've all talked about flexibility. How do you, one, learn as much as you can and two, get ready? Um, there is this Pixar film called Loop. Um, it shows, <laughs> I, I thoroughly enjoy it. I, it, I try to show it to as many people as I can because it is from the perspective of a child that has autism and the perspective of a camper that's helping a, and assist her. So you see the world through their lenses and how one sound might affect them and then how the community receives that need. So um, it's called Loop. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's on Disney plus, um, but you probably could just find it on YouTube. It's a short, uh, film. And, um, so if you don't have any prior experience, I think that perspective, you know, I, um, is great. And backpacks and kits are always, backpacks and kits are always welcomed. So if you don't have prior knowledge, um, good basics to have sensory uh 
headphones, earplugs, hats. Uh, if you get overheated, I know that can cause a lot of behavioral stuff for our community. So we have hand, hand fans, spray bottles, small things that won't get someone soaking wet, but it could help cool them down, shade. Um, we have uh, foldable chairs that we carry around. Um, accidents happen, you, you never know. I mean, I drink a lot of water and my bladder is super small, so I'm always running to the closest bathroom. So again, knowing where the closest bathroom is, um, I always had to know from my brother, where is the closest, that's the first thing I learned, where's the closest bathroom? Because people have to go, people have needs, you, that's the first one I always check. Um, and it, is it accessible? Is it a porta potty? Not my favorite, but is it an accessible porta potty? Those are the best ones out there. Um, sometimes we've had to change people in porta potties. Not so great, but you do what you can. Um, so wipes, gloves. Um, one of my teammates says it's not bad clothes, or it's not bad weather, just bad attire. So I always say <laughs> um, dress for the weather and then some, because we live in Seattle, so you never know. Two seconds ago, it was probably raining, and then now it's sunny, so layers is, are, are always welcomed. Uh, we do carry a wagon, a foldable wagon, uh, that can carry up to 300 pounds. So in case of worst case scenario, um, we can place someone in there. Wouldn't advise it, but worst case scenario. And um, when people are walking, if we trip and fall and we have all of our lunches and our backpacks and our things on us, um, we can't necessarily catch ourselves. So uh, we give them that space to care to put it in our wagon and we carry it around. Uh, we have basic water um, snacks if you have uh, diabetes. So if your blood sugar gets low, something that could easily bring you back up um, in our first aid kits. So yeah, just preparing for any worst case scenario but they're also small. So a lot of everything that we have fits into two backpacks, uh, essentially, and then our wagon if we need to bring more, so. Well, I agree, Thank Stephanie. You. I think that's wonderful information to be emergency prepared is very important, I think, especially when, if you can keep it compact and transferable. And uh, because we do have people that we have bags, two backpacks per person and, um, wherever we go. So those particular persons for their own specific needs, it can be quite a bagged situation luggage wise. Um, if I was an organizer, one of the things that I would do is to be able to make sure that um, at the event that we had, you know, if you're hosting the event, you should be able to think forward, think about what your audience, what your guests are going to need. And as a coordinator, you, I, I always try to think about what they're going to need. Are they going to need that? How are they going to need the sun classes? Do they have a map? Do they, when they get there, will there be a visual aid to show you exits, bathrooms, and so on? Um, one of the things of like Camp Wonderland that we're going to be going to there, they have a complete map and it's visual as far as where all of the accessibility signs are, the disabled accessibilities for the bathrooms, um, where the, the where the exits are, um, and so with that also being more so about having contact person on site for those on for those moments that are needing adaptability really quickly. And it, the question was about like a part of the question was day of what can you do? Um, okay. The, the person who asked was just like, how do we learn what people need? And oh. so the day of piece was like, okay, so you can learn ahead of time, but then day of, how do you respond? Okay. Well, I, I think to start, um, it, it, you just, when you organize an event or, you know, do outreach for an event, or even if you're having people to your house, just even just welcoming language, asking folks, um, you know, saying uh, we 
we want to support access needs and let us know how we can help and or even even day of even when I if I'm having people to my house um and if there's anyone coming who hasn't been to my house before I'll include access notes about my driveway and walkway and I have stairs you know exactly how many stairs up to the front porch and a railing and um or you know if if you want need a level surface to to um to join us in my house we can arrange that come through the come through the garage or come through the back door which isn't great but but um but that can work <laughs> for a private home um <clears throat> And I'll I'll mention how many stairs are in my house, and that there's a a nice sturdy railing, um, and well, and you know just getting to my house itself that that you can park right in front of the of the walkway that goes to my front door, um, and it's level, so um, I will share little access notes about just about my house, even for friends who haven't been over before. Um, I mean, you don't know if maybe somebody has a, has a sore knee that day or who knows what. <laughs> and, um, and appreciate that. And I'll mention, um, uh, I, I might also mention something about the bathrooms or um, that, you know, we can, open the windows and have better ventilation if someone needs that. But anyway, it's just, um, I think asking and then just, um, just sharing whatever basic information you can think of um, is a way to open the door for someone to think, oh, I didn't think I could even ask about that. I'll ask. Um, so... <laughs> One other yeah. thing I'd like to add is I think that it's important to make sure that you have that point contact referenced, that you have that area that you know that somebody that is coming in knows where to go to ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, at Friendship Adventures, when we do larger public events, we make sure that we are designated with our own logo or t-shirt or color, or if we have our participants that are out at uh, Disneyland that we all incorporate the themed shirts so we know who's where at what time, but they also, the participants also know who to go to in the event of an emergency. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Dominic. I'm uh, wearing a burgundy sweater and have uh, graying hair, a gray beard and black glasses. Um, and I, I'm here representing, partially representing the uh, Shoreline Tool Library. And so my question is a lot about what we're thinking about with my colleague, Anna Wilson here about where the classes we're going to be offering and how we can be most accessible in our location. One, one question though, to start with Stephanie, you mentioned hand over hand and I didn't know what that meant. I'll start with that one. Perfect. Uh, hand over hand. So, um, it's just as you, as it says hand over hand. So if someone needs guidance, you put your hand over hand uh, and guide them to said, um, so you can show them how to, open a water bottle or guide them to, sorry, thank you for being, uh, being my example, um, but it is just that guidance of a hand oh, over hand, um, almost like a one-to-one -one sure. situation. Um, but if you teach them hand over hand once, sometimes that is just the one time you need to do it. Mm. But sometimes people just need more hand over hand. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Experience. And it's a hand to hand access ride too. So there's a lot of, I guess that phrase that travels around our community. If you're a hand to hand, that means uh, you get delivered to that person hand to hand. So uh, mm -hmm. there's no wandering off or um, getting lost. You don't we, li we like to wander. <laughs> you don't leave them at the curb kind of Yes, thing, right? yeah. You can't just do curb drop off. Right. You, do, you have to um, give them to a person. Well, that's a good segue to my my um, other question about offering help. So, you know, when is it appropriate? And, you know, other than just common sense and extreme courtesy, I mean, how do you, are there any gotchas that you would want to talk about? Or, you know, 
how do you, as an able person, right, say, do you need help with the door? I mean, do you, can I do this for you or do that for you? When is that appropriate and when might it not be appropriate? And what sort of watch, watch out for there? Um, I try to teach my participants one stranger danger. So that might play into something that um, they might not accept help, but we do ask them to ask for help. If you ever need help, please ask for help. It's a good routine. It's a good thing to get. Um, yeah, it, just asking for help. Uh, I mean, just as a typical person, asking for help is really difficult for me. I am a doer. I'm a helper. I just do things. So I it has bit me in the butt where I just place myself in a situation where I'm like, oh, let me do that for you. And they're like, please. No, thank you. Um, but generally I have, my, I try to teach my participants to ask for help um, because not everyone, again, will treat them the same way and they're not as kind and understanding. Um, so if they have the communication to ask for help, you learn how to sign, help, help me, help you. Mm. Um, yeah, I think. Um, oh yeah, we're just asking, Hey, if you need help, I'm here. Um, I can be your point, your point person. If you need help, um, if we're in that setting or if you've come across a person, uh, and I mean, if you see them struggling to a point where you're like, okay, maybe I should ask for help since I'm the only person around. But, um, I think that question is very open yeah. Um, and we teach them, you can say yes or no, and no is a full sentence. No means no. So, yeah. So. Okay. Um, I'll ask one more question, and that is, well, until we get our accessibility point person in place, I'm just wondering, um, you know, it's great. You guys have given me all such great suggestions about things to consider, so that has been massively helpful. But I'm just wondering, how do we, when you have, like, we all have limited resources and maybe we have typically small events because our classes would might be quite small. How do you, if you put out the word in advance, like I think you suggested Stacy to three weeks in advance and just let, let us know. And here's the person to contact. If you have any accessibility needs, how do you manage expectations? I mean, we can't maybe translate every language or, you know, what, are, what all the things there might be asked for. Is there any things to, you want to just talk about or in terms of uh, just setting expectations of what we might be able to offer again, other than maybe just the obvious stuff. That's a hard um, I think yeah. people, <clears throat> uh, I mean, I've found that people are so thankful that we're asking mm. um, and that we're open that, um, I mean, people know that we can't, we can't meet every single thing and we're not going to 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 get it right every time either and we're we're going to to not think of everything so um i mean you know you can have something in your your language about that you know well you could say something like we'll we'll do our best to work with you um you know, you want the person to take the lead, of course, and in, in um, if they're comfortable doing that and and um, sharing. But yeah, just have. I mean, I, I haven't found anyone that expected us to to be able to provide everything. So, I think. Yeah, if you just say we'll we'll help you troubleshoot this or you know something like that, that's. Um, people know that's the best we can do. Okay, um, you know, I've had someone who was a, I was an access person and, and they were a presenter. It was over a, a few days of um, event. And, you know, after the first day, this, this person, we already had a rapport um, and they, they were telling me how, um, how nervous they were and that they just about shut down um, during it. And so, 
you know, that was just in a conversation. It wasn't in, in thinking in terms of access, but, um, you know, so we trouble, we did some troubleshooting on that and, and, um, what we came up with was, was this person, you know, and you know, I knew that if that happens with someone, that's not usually a time when they can ask for help because they're shutting down. <laughs> so we came up with a signal um, and, and um, this person said that, that, um, oh, they had a, a fidget thing that they often grabbed when they were starting to get a little too anxious. So, um, so, you know, that was the signal, you know, person said, if you see me grab this, I'm about to lose it. So then I would break in and say, let's take a little, you know, 30 second stretch break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, you know, we, sometimes it's just some creative thinking and, and that's, um, that's, all we can really do sometimes. So mm -hmm. people know that. Well, let me, I just have, was there something you wanted oh, to I add? I was just going to say that, you know, um, so many, there's so many different variables that go through there. And I understand what your, the challenge is there. And so the only thing that you can do is potentially offer resources. So, you know, picture grounds, uh, other communication devices are, can they write? Can they communicate by, via writing? Um, do they, you know, do they have that electronic device to be able to help communicate? Um, uh, we've all been in this community. And so we watch the behavior. We know what the behavior means, but for those that don't, you know, it's, it's taking that extra, as you say, that extra sense to be able to find out and locate what their need is. Okay. It's okay to not be able to do the accommodation. And I think I, we have it in our recreation guide, um, uh, three weeks for a reasonable accommodation. Um, I think adding that word reasonable sometimes brings that person <laughs> back because I've had had, um, we do dinner and a movie and um, they asked what was on the menu when I said we're doing pizzas and they wanted a very, very, very specific pizza for one person. So that technically wasn't a reasonable ask because it wasn't a dietary restriction. It wasn't a like, so a reasonable accommodation just for one person um it was more of a like or a dislike and so i guess differentiating the four like differentiating if it's a like or a dislike or if it's more of an accommodation um but knowing that yeah we can't meet every accommodation but just saying i will try my best and we'll keep in communication um people don't like to be strung along for that long of time so um you said for not having resources um I left my card back there um we have a team that is very knowledgeable and um if you guys ever want to pop into program and see how we run things uh we have an open door policy we just need to know beforehand and um our participants love getting to know new people but I think learning and viewing um, an event can help can help you in the future to create an event. Well, thank you. Well, again, thank you so much for all of your anecdotal stories and the considerations you made. And before I have one last question, before I pass the mic back to Constance, I just want to ask, how would you suggest that we engage the community of differently abled people for, you know, the things we might be planning. And I'll just let you kind of answer that and I'll just surrender the mic. And uh, again, thank you so much again for all of this. Group homes are, um, you can do, there's uh, a list of group homes uh, with the Arc of King County. Um, and it has, uh, they're like, main location or the office location and you can send um mail i guess is the best way to try to reach uh do community outreach um like that to get our community we do a recreation guys so it's a little bit more difficult in that sense of where that's how we 
market and we do our outreach. Um, but I know that a lot of these homes don't have like, they're not giving their address, but they do have offices so that you can send mail out. I guess I need to ask, could we reach out to you all to, to, to reach your communities for us? That's appropriate. Um, we could do partnerships for sure. <laughs> I think um, the city has a little bit of some policies and rules within there, but um, a partnership and creating a, an event together would be totally great. Uh, we're always welcoming people um, to create new experiences. So I think that would be good. We also have just a regular old community board to utilize. That's free space for anybody that would like to, if they use the paper format. Um, if there's anything that we do have that is going on internet or social media, we do have to have a little bit more uh, referral process involved in that. Uh, but ultimately, we are a, we are a networking program. We get to know our people, they get to know us, we're word of mouth, and so that that is a huge part of it. So you want to communicate to your to the to the contact to to the marketing to whomever you're speaking with whatever division uh, find out what is appropriate obviously and um, and be able to try to solicit that way. There's also transition fairs through the school districts um, that might be uh, that might be a an option as well where where people specifically go to network and um and talk about what programs they're offering and and um meet people who might be interested so that the shoreline school district could help you there we would think yeah okay we have something that you've talked about all of you in some way or another um, how have you been able to better connect with individuals with low technology literacy? Brandy, I think you mentioned that a few times. Paper format. <laughs> yes, we um, we share our paper um, similar to, you know, resource boards. And uh, that is, and then and we network. We recently, you know, the YMCA, the YMCA came in and actually posted on our board their information. They asked, of course, and posted on their board, which was paper. And, and it's not every day that you see somebody coming through your door with paper. Although, you know, Lake Forest Park has quite a bit of paper down there, don't they? Uh, the Lake Forest Park Mall. Um, so I, I do think that that is still an option for us, at least at our Friendship Adventures program, we are definitely wanting to move forward with more technology and would love would love input on that as well. Um, low technology, so printing, uh, but printing for them. Um, I feel very lucky that we have our Spartan Recreation Center and that they do our registration. So they are able to do phone calls, I think, talking to someone um, through the phone or face-to-face -face, mm -hmm. um, and giving them the tools. We do also have a, a, why can I think of the word? Not translation, but Interpretation. interpreter line. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> <laughs> we do have some of those resources through the city um, to be better communicate with um, different languages and different needs. Uh, yeah, I think the same paper. Um, uh, maybe using, well, people who can can uh, just who are comfortable using their phones. Um, so I think with phones these days, there are a lot of options. If someone uh, isn't computer literate or doesn't have a a computer or a tablet. Um, even just a phone call. So. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? A question? Um, I, I'll make a personal plug for 
when you do paper or when you do post something that you really think about not just how you're wording it, but what it looks like. Um, my reason for coming to this is I'm dyslexic and it was not diagnosed when I was young and I learned my way around things, sometimes better, sometimes worse, and um, it's exhausting. So if you can be really thinking about what is going to help people be able to see something, um, people who are dyslexic have what's known as word blindness. So you can choose your words very carefully, but unless you're using the right font and the right letting, it's, I can't read it. So, yes. That is the, um, the question is what kind of font is helpful? Fonts without serifs help. And it's so funny, my very first day at work here as I was walking in, I connected with somebody in IT who had just been hired as well and we were just talking about, I mean, it was just a way in. And he's like, so I'm really interested in fonts. And I'm like, do you know anything about fonts for dyslexia? And he goes, yes, there are all these new things. And so he sent me some links and I was able to download some that, that really did make a difference. So um, Arial's good, Aptos is good, but I think probably there are some that are even better. One other quick question for you, and I... I, I work with neighborhoods a lot when they set up their events and, you know, they're wonderful, big, boisterous summer events very often. And certainly Shoreline does this as well. What would you suggest for providing activities and quiet spaces for people? Um, it's, I think it's overwhelming for a lot of people who have stimulation overload quickly and you walk in and there's a band and you know there are the police over here and you know there's all this stuff going on what would you suggest i think that that could be really helpful to a lot of people as they plan their summer events i know that some people that plan events they do a quieter hour so they have a uh, softer bands less noise happening and so they get access to the community at an earlier time to uh, enjoy the rides or the event before the rest of the community comes in for those sensory needs. Um, and I forgot the rest of the question. Sorry, I, I have to visually see the question to remember <laughs> most of the parts of it. I think you got it. Brandy, the place that you're gonna be taking people in Texas, how is that set up for quiet space? I'm sure that's something you had to really research. Yeah, and they do. They, they a lot of um, space is really big, so they're located on a, on a large acreage, and so to have the space between each of the little recreation spots is really important um, to be able to. I think also during uh, community events um, to be able to plan for those sensory spots. So to have an area that is safe and notable, um, whatever you can use for outside sound, such as, you know, uh, plants, uh, whatever you can use for signage to know exactly where this place is, is very important. Police officers should generally not, they generally know, but they don't do the sirens and, um, and don't come in with flashing lights for people with epilepsy and uh, sensory. My brother used to, we would have to pat on a swivel to see if there was a fire truck coming uh, with a sound because they would send him um, over the edge. And um, so I think coming into this new age of understanding that we all have, uh, well, that there's more to the disabilities, um, they don't come in with sirens blaring and they they know not to turn them on as much as kids love that aspect of it but um i think if you just if you invite police and fire people um that they don't turn on their sirens unless it, it, they have to leave in case of an emergency but also maybe not doing it immediately within the event 
think also maybe an environmental control to be able to communicate with your neighbors and um, be able to find out if there's if they can do anything for whatever noise level that is. Um, you know, for instance, when we have events, obviously parking is a big thing for us. So we've reached out to our neighbors to make sure that we can access our parking areas during our large events. So just some forward planning in that can sometimes help. Yeah. Having some quiet area off to the side and, and having, having seats available um, for, you know, plenty of seating for folks who, who need that need to um, know that that's, you know, if you can have that at, a, at an outdoor event, that can be really helpful. Um, also for all kinds of reasons for seniors to feel comfortable attending. Um, and, and yeah, the quiet, uh, actually scheduling some quiet hours within the day and um, advertising that if folks want to choose those times to come. So for some reason, tables with chairs, please, please always do tables with chairs and yeah. you can leave spots for people who uh, use a wheelchair so they mm -hmm. can roll in, um, preferably not next to where the legs are. Um, they feel included and those as beautiful as they look, those aluminum tables aren't um, easy for someone <laughs> who has mobility issues to get in and out of um, the ones, the tables that have the, the yeah, picnic tables that have the seating attached. Those are not very inclusive because it has, some of them have an extra like two feet on the end for someone to wheel in, uh, but not most. <laughs> yeah, definitely separate separate tables and chairs. Um, even small things like inclusive language, um, you know, like I wouldn't say keep an eye out for this or look out for this maybe because we more like check. Uh, be aware. Yeah, be aware. <laughs> um, you know, just being conscious of what, what language you're using for those events can, can um, can just automatically help make it more inclusive. Would it, would it be appropriate if you, with your site map, if you knew that there were areas that would be quieter or engage people in a different way to say that? I mean, is that is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a question that I'm actually gonna direct to SUNY. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Does the city of Shoreline offer any services to make our physical space more accessible? And I'm not quite sure if it means accessible within the city. Um, is that, no? Oh, I see. Yeah. Yes. Um, the three of us will go. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't take. Yes, the clarification is um, she was speaking specifically of the tool library, which is a wonderful resource, but how can they get advice for making it as accessible as possible? She was wondering if, if that's something that anyone in the city could do. Um, we don't have a person, like the city of Bellevue has an ADA coordinator and, and I don't know that they do that, but the ARC, um, I believe has staff that would do that. Like you could um, ask for someone to come. Um, and do you all know of other resources? Me. <laughs> <laughs> our participants, we could take our participants on the field trip and they would love to. I to tell you, <laughs> yeah. I think they you speak have, your mind. Yeah, I think you have some options, but yeah, as far as like a city staff person that's designated, yeah. that's not um, something, but yeah, and I feel like this has been an opportunity, um, you know, for you to, to, you know, to build community and Stephanie has mentioned and um, Randy and Stacey, the resident, like we're all here together. So, Feel free to, you know, act as we're closing up to reach out and, um, you know, there's there's one one workshop does not 
make us all experts. This is a, a conversation that's always ongoing and how can we make things better and, uh, and more inclusive all around. So I think, did you have one last one? Just one quick reminder, um, if you signed in tonight, which I hope you did, um, and give me your email address because Stacy has sent some really helpful videos and I'll send you the links to those. And Stephanie, you mentioned um, that Disney movie. If the Pixar Loop. I, if you can find a link for that, I would yeah. love to include that. And I will do follow-up emails to any of you who either have asked for that in chat tonight or send me an email. My email address is in chat. Yeah, so I'm happy to follow up. Yeah, the Arc of King County and there's Arc of Snohomish uh, County. Uh, they are, it's a variety of resources and um, most of them are free and they do offer classes that you can sign up for. Um, but again, I think in terms of like budgeting and uh, not maybe having access to taking those classes. Um, they are a really great resource for free. They do like, since they give examples or pages of sensory um, performances or sensory friendly performances um, and they divide it up by city too. So um, we can uh, put in their link as a resource. All right, well, um, I would like to thank our panel. <laughs> thank you. And all of you, so have a great rest of your evening and hopefully we'll look forward to connecting more in the future. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.